I'm a data scientist at BMW. And today I'm going to um, discuss machine learning as a software architecture for machine learning applications in a production-like environment. That is, regarding machine learning in general, there's no doubt that data pre-processing and the training of AI models are absolutely crucial. However, unless an AI model is deployed and frequently yields results to previously issued inference requests, it just doesn't add any value to an organization, right? So today I focus explicitly of the, uh, on the post-training step. And here we go. The experience we made at BMW is that the migration of AI models from the training laboratory environment to what we call production, so a prediction phase or inference phase, is quite a long way. And to give you an idea what we are up to, um, so I assembled the most important high-level requirements um, which are valid for our business context. What we are doing anyway is um, we have huge fleets of cars and what we do is we monitor the intercomputer traffic from cars. Doing that we've got two use cases. So one is um, if a car is driving, um, we persist all the network traffic between computers, so we call them ECUs, and once the car is back on its home base, um, we upload them and then they are analyzed. And that's what is done in an on-premise cloud environment. However, in a second use case, um, we can also do the analysis in real time in a car. So everything we do is uh, about development cars, cars under development. And then what we would like to do is to complement our current tool set with the possibility to analyze these intercomputer traffic um, based on machine learning, based on AI models. So, and also the fleet of cars we are maintaining implies that we want to do um, remote software updates, like we would like to do us updates remotely of the application itself and also of the AI models then. Mm, so in order to cope with all these challenges, this is what we use as a tech stack currently. Um, these are all well important for us. However, in order to discuss the high level concepts, the first two points from that list are really crucial. That's why I will discuss them in more detail. And the other points from that list, we will rather touch on the fly. You could say that for this kind of application, WebAssembly is really at the nucleus. Um, so technically, WebAssembly is about a byte code instruction format that is designed to be executed on a stack-based machine in a virtual environment. And just in case it reminds you of the Java virtual machine, I think you got a point because personally, I really like to compare the JVM to WebAssembly. If you remember, the JVM once entered the stage with a promise to make it possible writing portable code. Uh, today, there are quite a few people saying that finally, WebAssembly will deliver what the JVM once promised, but never fully, fully um, put into reality. So coming back to WebAssembly then, other high-level design goals of WebAssembly are security and speed. And security, for example, if you compile code to what's called um, and executed as a WebAssembly module, it runs in a sandbox-like environment. And the well uh, implications are rather severe that from that safe or secure guest module, you cannot reach and access the host environment. Like you cannot access the host file system, you cannot access host network sockets, you cannot even get the time from a host clock. Mm. To put that on a meter level, the, the characteristic of what and how I perceive WebAssembly is such that it has quite a few well-selected high-level design goals on which it delivers brilliantly. And on the other hand, if you assume or if you um, expect other concepts, which you would assume to be naturally there in any modern software development context, there are just a few which are just out of the scope of WebAssembly. And that's where the next point from our tech stack comes in. So I introduce Vasm Cloud. First hand, Vasm Cloud is an open source project under the hood of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, um, brief CNCF. In a narrow sense, it is designed to be a VASM host runtime. That is, it's a runtime where you can execute WebAssembly modules. Well, the ambitions are much 
broader and higher, so in a broader context. This is about a platform for providing portable and secure business logic and applications, and you can deploy them anywhere. So you can deploy them in a cloud context, on the edge, and even on browsers. And what's pretty interesting from my point of view is the question how Vasm Cloud relates to WebAssembly. And, and this makes them a very powerful team. So um, Vasm Cloud may, takes advantage of the very strong Unix selling points of WebAssembly, where concepts are present and where they are not. It adds, so it complements WebAssembly by other concepts. And to give two examples, so in the documentation of Vasm Cloud, you will almost know here read about WebAssembly modules um, because they kind of promote the concept of pure WebAssembly modules and render it being an actor. So the term comes from the well known paradigm of concurrent compute because inherently Vasm WebAssembly doesn't have any notion of concurrency, at least not in the main trunk. I think there are proposals today, but so not in the mainstream. Um, and Using Vasm Cloud, you get WebAssembly module characteristics plus concurrency. So the other aspect we already addressed, that um, you cannot deal um, with peripherals from within WebAssembly. Um, Vasm Cloud resolves that by just introducing a second type of technical entity called capability provider. And whenever you have to deal with peripherals from your business logic, you can connect to a specific capability provider via well-designed interfaces called contracts, and then you can do whatever you would assume to be doing in a modern software development environment. So now I think we have all the technical ingredients to discuss real-world machine learning applications, and I would like to approach this topic from a rather development perspective. So then um, at the very heart of such an application is probably what you call an inference engine. In fact, we have two. We currently provide Onyx and TensorFlow, and both reside in a first capability provider. And then on the left hand, you have the endpoint to the application, so that's where you address um, inference request to. Currently, that's an HTTP server. You can also secure the, the communication chain. And in a very trivial use case, then, so you send data, input data to this HTTP server. It's routed to the RP actor. That's where you want to define your endpoints. So the RP, you can define REST-like endpoints. You can pre-validate the incoming data, and then it's routed directly to the inference engine. And also the way back, such that the response from the AI model is handed to the user and then adding value that way. However, in a more general use case, you would like to have additional business logic. And that is because by only using RP actors, um, you have a severe requirements for your users. That is an arbitrary AI model usually expects its input data, well, in a multidimensional data structure called Tensor, but um, where the Tensor has very specific dimensions and also other statistical characteristics. So uh, if you do not hand a Tensor the way an AI model requests, um, it will either not deliver valuable uh, results or not work at all. Um, that's why you want to make use in a more general case of a pre- and post-processing step where um, such that your users may then send in arbitrary data that is pre-processed such that it matches the, the needs of your AI model and then send back. And uh, before sending back to the user, you want to apply post-processing because the results are usually not interpretable by human beings, um, you want to apply some mathematical post-processing. So, to give an example, so the today's application I brought here, um, this is about image classification. So uh, I have two models with me, which on which we'll have a look later on, um, which are trained on a, a thousand classes and they are designed to um, recognize classes from images. So classes of objects are animals. Um, what you're going to do, so for example, with the curl command, you can um, issue your request. And in that example, then we put in a, an image and it can be of arbitrary dimensions. So the pre-processing step will make the dimensions match to what the AI model needs. And then the model output, at least now example, will give you 1000 scalars. So for each class, 
um, against what it has been trained, one number. And only after having applied a softmax fun uh, function, um, you can interpret it as a human being, so in terms of probabilities. Well, my proposal is to switch to the demo application. Let's see if that works. Oh, it's pretty small, so maybe I have to describe well, what I'm going to do. So we have uh, another image of a whale, and you will not be able to read the dimensions. So it, it has arbitrary dimensions. The models, however, which I brought today, they need the image dimensions be in 224 by 224. So now, It may be too small, but uh, so just in case you can read it, you will hopefully recognize that curl command. We This is a put method. We will send an arbitrary image to that model. And so within the segments of the URL path, you will find the endpoints or the address of the HTTP server, which I have previously configured for us. Then you need to mention which model you want to use. So that's in the second segment. And the last segment that is called matches, um, it tries to make life as easy as it can. So it applies a pre and a post processing step such that um, we can send in arbitrary images and get back results, which we can directly interpret as, as persons. So for example, you've seen the image of that whale. So um, the, we see the five matches, the top five matches of what the model thinks it gets as input. And the first match, so with almost 100% probability, is a gray veil. And uh, without being an expert in biology, I think that, well, it matches quite well. Mm. We might want to look at a different example. So I think we also have cats here in our image database. Let's look up the cat. Yeah. So if we look at that before applying that to our machine learning model, I hope you recognize it and I hope you see the stripes, so the dark stripes. So now if we ask the model to interpret it for us, The top five entries are tabby cat, and for all non-native speaker, tabby is tiger-like. And in fact, the second position, we have a tiger cat, so it thinks that we have um, a tiger cat in our image. And, uh, well, only at the fifth position, uh, it thinks that this might as well be a paper towel, but note that the probability is really small. Um, so I said that, that's not very well visible. I said that, um, so in the second segment to the last, you have the model. There are other models we can apply. Let's make a last example. So what we have issued our request against now, this is mobile net. We also have squeeze net. just didn't type it, oh, it doesn't matter. Um, then we make that example maybe later. Um, so that's the inference pipeline. And now we have the picture from the development perspective. So if we look rather from the operations perspective at the same application, um, you likely have an empty runtime that is before deployment and you have two other technical entities. And that is one model repository and one OCI registry where OCI is for open container initiative. So you can um, just take an arbitrary container registry. The model repository, we take uh, as a bindle, so uh, the open source project bindle from Dice Labs, and that's where your AI models reside. So uh, probably um, the data sciences from your department previously have uploaded their trained AI models in there. And in the OCR registry, that's where your capability providers and the actors reside. So uh, when deploying something into your runtime, you will want to select all the items you need for your application and then by external configuration files, which may easily put into um, 
version repositories, you can define your application such that the entities are downloaded from the OCI registry. And once the inference engine is up and running, you do the same with the AI model. So um, once this is configured, the inference engine will download the AI models into its context such it can apply and use them. Mm, just in case your application runs bigger, um, you may want to know what's going on in your application and that's um, why Vasm Cloud provides a view Oh, which is not here. So we can make it bigger. So it provides a browser-based UI and it shows what is called the inventory of any given runtime. I hope you recognize by now the two providers we have deployed. So that's the HTTP server and uh, the inference engine. It's called here ML inference. On the left hand, we have our three actors. So that was the, the RP actor, which defines the application's endpoints. And we have a post-processor and a pre-processor. And you, you also have the host info. So that's the one host, which is currently running. And what we didn't discuss so far is all the linked definitions. So I said maybe briefly that if an actor, so your piece of business logic, needs to deal with peripherals. It does so on behalf of a capability provider and you have to link it explicitly. And by the explicit step of linking, you can provide configuration um, information. So for example, um, at the very step, when you link the inference RP against the inference engine, you would hand over the models which you want to use in your application. We can briefly look at how that is done in code, maybe. So you maybe recognize the MobileNet V2 model. That's the one we issued our request again against. And then I had some typos for the squeeze net. This is the second model, which is downloaded from the entrance engine into its context. And then we have a few just for debugging purposes. But the interesting point to take here from is that um, this kind of logic is not part of the, of the code base. It's given by external configuration files. And also what we didn't address so far, if you take the whole setup, I didn't mention yet that the high-level entities, they are currently all deployed on my machine just to show them, to be able to show them easily. They may very well be distributed among different nodes, so maybe also spread geographically. Yeah, I think we have all the aspects we need. That leaves me with some side remarks, or final remarks. So uh, the example application we looked at is in that GitHub repository. And in case you are interested, you want to reach out, collaborate. Uh, we usually meet in the Vasen Cloud Slack channel. Thank you very much for listening.